First of all, I'd just like to uh, welcome my mother. That's my mother. Who could give you a much better lecture than, than I could. I, I know, because she used to give me a lot of lectures. <laughs> and she was always right. But uh, the center, really, of Torah, the center of the giving of Torah, really, is the Ten Commandments. And since what we're about to celebrate or experience together... Sure, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you. What we're about to experience um, in the next uh, day is the receiving, giving, and receiving of the Torah, and the Aseris Adibres, the Ten Commandments, are really the, the central, <coughs> central the core, perhaps, around which the rest of the Torah is built. There are many of our authorities who explain how all the mitzvahs in the Torah emanate from the Ten. <coughs> in other words, all 613 mitzvahs or all 620 mitzvahs, if you take the expanded, if you include the mitzvahs of the non-Jews, or the seven mitzvahs of the seven rabbinic mitzvahs, you will see that they are all derivable from the root ten. Of course, the ten themselves are derived from the first two. The first two are derived from the first one. The whole of the first ones contained in the first word. All of the first words contained in the first letter. That's the way Torah always works. But in terms of explicit commandments, it's the ten that are written or engraved on the luchos, the tablets, which form the core of Torah in general. So, before we get to the early morning hours of Shavuot, and we hear the reading of the Torah, and we hear those ten read, and we make an acceptance which is a seminal moment in the year, let's try and put a little thought into studying those ten and seeing if we can pick out some of the fundamental issues, perhaps a little bit more than the basics that I'm sure most of us, with which most of us are familiar. <coughs> First of all, you know that the... <coughs> you know that the ten commandments were, were engraved on stone blocks, tablets, right? Look at this. These blocks were cubic, right? Do you, know, do, you know, do you know that, unlike the popular conception, they were not rounded? Do you know that if you, in any shul throughout the world, and throughout the generations, in fact, you'll see that the tablets are depicted as having rounded tops, so you, you must be familiar with that. That, in fact, is completely inaccurate. You know that the, the Gemara is clear that they were square or cubic or rectangular. They were completely, completely straight. And the letters, the words, were bored through, not just engraved, but actually bored right through. The reason that the depiction of the Luchos is always with rounded tops is because there's a childlike depiction of the tablets as having the element of a heart. You know, it's, it, the, the childlike, the child's depiction of the heart is always that classic depiction with the two rounded elements on top. What you have here is the blending in the harmonizing of what the tablets actually look like and the element of a heart. And the reason is, of course, that not only is this the heart of Torah, but the idea is that they should be engraved on the Jewish heart. It says, Kas veim aluach libecha. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Aluach libam echteveim. I will write them on the tablets of <coughs> the luchos of the, of the heart. You know that engraving always means <coughs> there's no detail in Torah that's extraneous. The idea of an engraving is always that the medium forms one with the message. You know, the difference between engraving and writing is that in writing you have one medium on another. <coughs> the Torah is written in the highest spiritual world as white fire or black fire on white fire and comes down into the physical, whatever that means, Kabbalistically, and comes down into the manifest world as, a, as an ink on cloth. You're on cloth, right? Contrasting contrasting media one on another, and from the contrast you see, the, you see what's revealed. It's a very deep idea why it has to be that way. 
but engraving is not the same. Engraving is where you use no second medium. You simply express the, you express the, the ideas or the writing or whatever you want to call it. You express the, the words in the medium itself. In fact, when you bore something through, that's the deepest form of engraving. The lookouts were not just engraved by, by the surface being, being uh, embossed or in relief. The, 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 the tablets were bored through. That means you could read the commandments. You could read through... And the Gemara says, if you read them from the reverse surface, they read forwards as well. There was no back. It's also a deep Kabbalistic idea. Although, of course, that's miraculous, right? If you bore writing through a tablet, when you read it from the back, it will read backwards. Correct? Anyone out there? <laughs> that's what it will read like. But with the Lukas, it read forwards from both sides. And not only that, of course, but the letters that have sustained central portions, the Samach and the Mem, in Hebrew, which are unsupported by any... Yes? Circular letters with a central piece remain suspended. You can't carve like that normally. That central piece will, will fall, right? They were, will fall. They were, what is the meaning of being bored through? The meaning is that engraving, what you call chakika, that means to a chok in Hebrew. They're interesting. The word chok, which means a Torah law, right? All the laws of the Torah are called chukim. We divide them into chukim and mishpatim, right? Chukim and mishpatim, two different categories of law. But in, at root, all the laws of the Torah are called chukim which is the deepest word, or one of the deepest words, expressing laws that come from an unknown source, an unknowable source. The word chok in Hebrew does not only mean that it is a law, the same Hebrew root means to engrave. I mean, the fundamental message here, the fundamental message is that these laws are engraved in reality. That means the reality of the world is these laws. It's not something that's imposed, that this is the way you behave in order to be a decent person. And of course that's true, but there's much more. This is the way you behave in order to manifest being part of reality. When you go against this reality, when you go against this, you're not only misbehaving or sinning, you're stepping out of reality. Right? You fundamentally damage the, 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 the essential mode of the world. You, sem- you essentially damage the fabric of the world. That's what it means. The chok means that these are, these are true things from an unknowable source, but they're engraved, or they engrave themselves, you like, on the fabric of reality. And of course they're engraved on your heart. They're engraved on the Jewish heart, because that is the, that is the prime resonance with the external reality, is in the center of the being, which, which is what the heart means. That's the idea of a luach, with engraving, as opposed to something that is written. The rest of the Torah is written. <coughs> but these central elements, these ten things, they're engraved. Right? It means that... And then, of course, is the idea of forming the Jewish heart to bring these things to explicit, explicit manifestation, to, to acknowledge them, to know them, to have them, let's say, bored or engraved in your own consciousness, in, in your own heart. The... Uh, the boring through, of course, means that it isn't only, isn't only engraved. It means that the message and the medium are entirely one. The heart is nothing else than these, than these ten. As an aside, it's worth noting, as an aside, that we've often shared here together the idea that modern Hebrew is anti-spiritual. Right? Sorry to have to tell you that. But modern Hebrew right, is not, not classical, not Torah, not Torah language. But modern Hebrew, which is the product of a a secular mindset in its usage is very often the opposite, unfortunately, of the spiritual death. This is not only because it was set into motion and constructed in the modern idiom, let's say, by secular people, but also because the whole notion of using a language that is holy in an everyday mundane context automatically gives it that gives it that tenor. You know that it's always been the, the, the custom of the Jewish people not to use Hebrew as a spoken language. I don't know if you're aware of that. Throughout Jewish history, from first temple times on, during the Bais Rishon, during the first temple, <coughs> we spoke Hebrew, but that's because the people lived at a prophetic level. So they and their language and their perception were all one at the level of Kedusha. But after the destruction of the first temple, the, uh, the sages, the Jewish people, took on not to use Hebrew as a spoken language. Even in countries where it required constructing a language. In the Sephardi countries, they constructed Ladino. And in the Ashkenazi countries, they constructed Yiddish. Huh? These, were, these were not languages sort of uh, accrued by some sort of folk momentum. They, they developed because of a very specific Torah principle that we don't use Hebrew as a spoken language. It's a whole subject in its own right and needs to be understood. But the basic idea is that when you use a language in a mundane or... You use it in the, in, the, in the mundane path of life, then the meaning of the words takes on those unspiritual and mundane meanings. And once your language is invested with concepts like that, then you can't speak spirituality anymore. Because every time you try and convey something spiritual, the word for you holds its mundane meaning. Right? 
just like perhaps the best illustration, I mean, it's a long subject in its own right, the best illustration really is to share this with you in, your, in, in our language. In English, the concepts you have in your spoken language are the concepts you had, the unspiritual, non-spiritual, mundane concepts that you had imprinted, let's say, on your consciousness from the earliest years of your life, right? And from the culture that you live in. All the English words we use don't only denote what they purport to denote, they also denote a whole, a whole ambience, a whole... M- many nuances and angles of a culture that you live in. The English words we use are rich with Christian, secular, Western, Christian or secular Western influences. So when you say those words in English, when I say the word angel to you, if I talk about angels, right? What angels, the word malach really means an emanation of transcendent existence from a higher world into this world. That's what it means. But if I use the word angel, you see a little child without many clothes, flapping through the air on these very un-aerodynamic wings, uh, you know, with the looking completely ridiculous. I mean, that's how you... And if you say you don't see that, you're lying, because that's what you see. And if I say God, for example, you don't picture the essence of reality. You picture a man in the sky with a white beard. And if you say you don't, you're lying. And most Jews who reject Jewish notions, they correctly reject them, because the notions that they think are the ones they're supposed to have are completely wrong. And they're quite right to reject those. They're not being atheistic in rejection of those things. They're being deeply religious. And it goes on and on. If I talk about saints, for example, I talk about a saint, you see a sort of a Rubenesque painting with a, some beautific sort of looking person with a little gold ring levitating above his head. You know, that's what you see. And, and so forth and so on. That's to say nothing about terms like de- the devil, you know, uh, or Satan and uh, hell, you know, where you see very, you know, <laughs> very clear, very clear pictures. That's how we built. The reason is because the language is invested with those pictures. There's no way you can escape that. And it's to avoid those preconceptions that we never spoke Hebrew. Because if you speak Hebrew and you see those, you see those elements, so then you can't retreat into another, that's why the Jews did that, they spoke other languages, so that when they learned Torah, Torah could be a Torah language. Many of our sages say that the fact that the modern, the modern language, although there are tremendous advantages, obviously, to speaking Hebrew, there are tremendous advantages in knowing Hebrew as a spoken language, but you lose a tremendous amount, because when you grow up in, a, in, a, in an environment like that, the words are, the words are loaded with those connotations. There's no two ways about that. Right? And some of them are, some of them are extremely per- pernicious. I mean, the, there's, a, there's a long list of these, of course, but to share one with you, the word Agada in Hebrew, the word Agada, Agada really means it's that portion of the Talmud or of the received oral law which deals with the deepest mystical areas. The word Gad in Aramaic means to draw or to bring from one dimension to another. Right? Gad is the Hebrew root that uh, deals with... Um, Things like the Mazal, which is the, 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 the astrological world, the world of astrological forces, let's say. Incidentally, that word itself is perverted. Mazal, not Mazal means in Hebrew, you see how, how strangely we think. Mazal means to flow. The Hebrew word nozel is a liquid. Right? Mazal means to flow. The idea is that there's an energy that flows from an unrevealed source world, it flows down into the revealed world and has its influence or its effect. But, our, but the, but the con- conventional translation of mazal is luck. Luck means exactly that which is not connected to a higher source. So when you say mazal tov, when you say mazal tov, if what you mean is good luck, you are manifesting an atheistic and idolatrous... That, that's what you, what you are wishing this young couple who are now getting married, when you say mazal tov, is that may your marriage turn out like three cherries in a row, you know, in... <laughs> a casino in Nevada you know that is what you and of course if you say that the chance of their marriage working out is about the same chance as uh, getting three cherries in it that is not what you mean you don't mean good luck you don't mean good that's the last thing you mean we don't believe in luck we believe that everything that happens is the, is the flowing down <laughs> do you understand how opposite we <clears throat> the word agada means drawing down from a deeper dimension the Hebrew root, root gad, good, for example, in, in Aramaic, good means to draw, good asik means to lift up, good achis, yeah, to draw up, to draw down. Gado is the bank of a river which, which blocks and leads, etc. But in modern Hebrew, agada means fairy tales. That's what it means to the modern Israeli ear. 
So if you, if you sit down with a young fellow who's saying a yeshiva who's never had a chance to study Torah and he's a Hebrew speaker, and you say we're going to study Agadot. So to him that means fairy tales. Because in modern Hebrew parlance that's what it is. Agadot Yapaniot. You know, Japanese fairy tales. or that, that, That's what it means. So he can't, he doesn't have, you, you see you've damaged the, is, it, is this, and there's many other examples. I mean, when the Chumash, classic examples, it's not our subject tonight, we're talking about the Ten Commandments, but <laughs> the point is they have to understand this. When the, this is why you have to learn Hebrew. This is why you have to learn Hebrew. So that you can, not as a spoken language, you have to learn it with its Kedusha so that you can, because it's the medium of, the, of these transcendent concepts. When the Torah says, Tov Ma'od, that Hashem, God looked at the world and He said it was very good, right? Hashem, God looked at the world and He said, Ki Tov Ma'od, it's very good. The commentaries all ask the question about the word Ma'od. Ma'od means very. How can Hashem, how can God look at the world and say it's very good? Surely anything that He makes that's good is the best good there can be. What do you mean very good? You hear the problem? So they say very means death. Or it means the force of human negativity. All sorts of amazing answers. Ma'od in Hebrew is the same letters as Adam. Right? And ma'od means, it means man, it means money, it means all sorts of amazing things, and all sorts of commentaries. But to a modern Israeli ear, tov ma'od means 8 out of 10. That's what it means, because it's, it's just one step below Mitzuyan, it's what the Morah is giving it late at night when she's tired, and she's not giving Mitzuyan anymore, because she's tired, she's giving tov ma'ods, that's what it means, 8 out of 10. So they, they see a God looking at the world and giving it 8 out of 10. And there's no way you can get, do you understand, you can't eradicate those... Now, one of these words, why, why are we discussing this this evening? Because one of these words that is misrepresented in Hebrew is the word luach. Luach, in Hebrew, luchot even, the, the luach, right? There were two tablets of stone on which the Ten Commandments were engraved. Luach means, what luach means is a stone material. Stone is always the building block of reality. Why was it stone? Why were they made of stone? Even, right? Stone is always the building block of reality. Even, in Torah, <coughs> always means the fundamental element, let's say, of building. Like Evan Shasia, the, the stone of formation from which the world expanded. Or Evan Ma'asu Abuenim, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone of the structure. We always talk about a stone as the fundamental element. So what we're talking about here is the fundamental medium of the world on which the fundamental message of the world is, is embedded in an ir- ineradicable fashion. That's what it means. That which can never be ingra- I- I- erased. You can't erase engraving unless you break the thing that it's on. You're talking here about a message of ultimate permanence. In modern Hebrew, luach means a blackboard. It means by definition that which is immediately erasable. Did you understand the opposite? And there's no other word in Hebrew. You can't do it. Even in the Yiddish-speaking Chedus, the Rebbe says to the child, Geit sum luach, that's what he says, because there is there's no other word for that. Do you understand what's going on here? And it's opposite. But nevertheless, that's the point. The point is we're dealing here with these stone on the first tablets, the ones that were ultimately broken, the Maral explains that the written and oral law were both written. There was no oral law. There was the same clarity where, where all the message of the world, the written and the oral law, was all, I mean, tangible and immediate. That was broken. And they, they, because the tablets were broken, they led us to a situation where only the Ten Commandments, as it were, were written. And those were carved by human hand. Moses, Moshe Rabbein had to carve those. The Vash, a different story entirely, completely different manifestation than the first ones were. But that is the that's the medium, and that's the, the message, that's, in, that's what it is. Now, obviously, if that's the way it's set up, we need to understand why these things are fundamental. A question you can ask is, why these ten? I mean, there are a lot of uh, 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. All of them are essential, really. The Rambam says that if you, if you extract one word of the Torah, you've destroyed the whole Torah. It's like electric circuit. If you pull out one piece, the lights go off. There's nothing that's more essential than anything else. On the contrary, it's absolutely axiomatic to believe that every letter of the Torah is vital. If you have one cracked letter in the Sefer Torah, or one letter missing, even partially missing, the whole thing's invalid. The whole thing's invalid. It's an organic entity where you need all of it. So why are these ten more fundamental? Or more, or different? What, 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 is, what is it about these ten that makes them the, the focus, or the core? And furthermore, why are there two tablets? You know the Kabbalistic source number is always ten. I can't go into that this evening. But the root number on which the world is built is always ten. The ten elements. Ten that become one. Ten is the ultimate expression of breakdown becoming one. Ten people to get together, you have a minion. Minion means that a, a, special, a special manifestation of Kedusha takes place here. Now, just by virtue of the fact that you put ten people together. Why are they split into two? For that matter, why do you have a right and a left hand with five on each? Right? Why do you... 
And the mystical sources say that the tablets, they fit like this, in face-to-face relationship. That the five on the one are parallel to the five on the other. You have to understand this. What does it mean, this parallel? And why are they split into two? Let's try and study that to the extent that we can. See if we can extract some, perhaps some modern, particularly modern application. Let's see. Let, let's, let's attempt that. The fundamental concept is like this. You know that the five on the first tablet, the five commandments, the first five, are, are what we call Ben Adam Lamakin. That's between us and Hashem, between man and God. The second are interpersonal mitzvahs. Right? You, you notice that breakdown. The, perhaps the one that we need to think about a little more is the fifth on the first tablet is honoring parents. Honoring parents at face value would seem to be an interpersonal mitzvah. It would not seem to be a man-God mitzvah. Right? Not at, f- at face value. Of course, it is also... When you treat people correctly, obviously you're also obeying a divine commandment. There's no question about that. It applies to all interpersonal relationships. But why that fifth one is on the divine side and on the human side needs some thought. But there's no question, and there's a lot of depth to that, but there's no question that the first five are mitzvahs, what we call Ben Adam Lamakim, between me and Hashem, His commandments to me, and the second are between me and you. Right? They, they split up that way. The, um, the first detail to understand here which is often very badly misunderstood. And perhaps the more religious your background, the more perhaps knowledgeable, the more you were trained in, in religious practice, thought and practice, perhaps the more difficult this point is to grasp. And that is, and of course those who are brought up without any formal Jewish knowledge, there's the opposite problem. And that is this, that why, again, why are there two sets here? Surely all of Torah is divine command. I mean, that has to be plain. If I treat you correctly, I visit you when you're sick, right? I give you money when you need it. I help you in whatever way I need to help you, because those are Torah commandments. Surely I'm doing that ultimately because Hashem commands me to do that. Surely. These are divine commandments, all ten. If so, why do we have to split them into five and five? You're not talking just about a list that begins with five and ends with another five. You're talking about two separate tablets here. Two completely separate... They're separate entities here. Obviously they bond, but they... But the concept is this. Let's try and state the concept and then understand as deeply as we can. The concept is that these things are obligation. Right? The Torah is only obligation. We have to establish that. The Torah is only obligation. There's nothing, the Torah doesn't say any place, if you like, do this, and if you feel like it, do that. The Torah doesn't say that. The Torah only talks about obligations. You know, for that matter, just to understand how far this goes, let's try and understand this. The Torah doesn't even talk about rights. Do you know that? Know what's strikingly different between the Torah, which is our constitution, and the constitution of all states or city-states or, or countries or democracies, is that the parlance, the currency, if you like, of the modern political system is rights. I think universally so. And in Torah, rights are never mentioned. You know that? It's a fascinating thing. In the oral law, rights are richly dealt with. But in the written law, rights are never phrased. That, uh, I see some blank faces. Let, let's try to make this plain. First of all, you know that every obligation implies a right. That, that's plain, right? No? My obligation not to steal, an obligation upon me, equates to your right to your property. Your right to free speech, for example, means I'm not allowed to interfere with that. Correct? When two people enter a relationship, what, I'm, what, what one is obliged to give is what the other one's entitled to receive. Your right is to those things that I'm obliged to give. Right? A man in marriage, for example, is obliged to give his wife more honor than himself. So that's her right, and it's his obligation, right? The Rambam says a man has to love his wife as himself and give her more, honor her more. That means if the only decent clothes for one, she has to get it. Right? She has to get it. There's only one decent... Uh, the, the wife comes first. That means it's his obligation. A man has to provide his wife with clothing, with jewelry, with cosmetics. A new outfit every yont of, actually. <laughs> Those are his obligations, right? So, that's her right, and it's his obligation. All relationships are like that. All interactions involve... (coughs) If you look at the constitutions, the Bill of Rights, let's say, they even call it the Bill of Rights, of modern democracies, you'll find that all of these elements, all of these parameters are grasped as rights. If the Torah only phrases the obligation end... The Torah doesn't never say you have a right to your property. It doesn't say that. It says, it doesn't say you have a right. I'm not allowed to steal. 
The Torah only phrases, it doesn't say you have a right to life, it says I'm not allowed to kill. A remarkable thing. Completely at variance with the modern grasp. And the reason, again, it's a whole discussion in its own right, but very briefly, the reason is, there are deep reasons here, but at least one reason is this, that when you manifest, when you focus, when you manifest a right, you are setting yourself up as a taker. And when you manifest an obligation, you set yourself up as a giver. That means if, if you have a right and I have an obligation, I'm the one who has to provide that thing. And you're the one who can take and claim that thing. Right? If the wife needs, let's say, a certain amount of clothing that the husband has to... So that's her right. If she's the, she, in that position, she's a taker. And in that particular relationship, he's the giver. Right? He's obliged to give. So that you equate, and our sources are very clear about this, you equate obligations with a sense of giving and rights with a sense of taking. And the spiritual position is the position of giving and not taking. And the root for that, of course, is obvious. Hashem, God, can only give. He can't take. I mean, can't. We use that, we use that terminology. He's only a giver, as it were. So to imitate the divine, you need to be a giver, not a taker. Right? There's a rich Torah literature about that, about that point. And therefore, we, we grasp all the spectra of human interrelationships, we grasp them at the obligations and giving end, not the rights and the taking end. In fact, if you ask for a Jewish definition of the problem with society today, if you really, if you have to, from a Torah perspective, what is wrong with society? There are a few things out there that are not exactly perfect, if you hadn't, uh, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> the problem is that the individual, we would say, is developed with a sense of what's owed to him. And the Jewish ideal is that the individual has to be brought up with a sense of what he owes. Our, our concept is you have to develop a human being. The, the, the correct development of a child is to see himself as obliged and a giver. And if all parties to all relationships see themselves as givers, you'll have bliss. If two parties enter a marriage, each one only concerned about what he or she can give to the other, you have a blissful relationship. If two people enter a relationship and each one is anxious about what he can get from the other and what the other owes, you have a struggle right away. In society, when each member of society is, is focusing on what he, he or she must give to society, you have a blissful interaction. And by the way, the political system is pretty much irrelevant. If all the members of the society are anxious to fulfill their duties, it doesn't really matter how capitalist or how... That's not really the issue. But if all members of the society are anxious about what they can get out of the system, then no political system will work. Because everybody's going to try and... That's a formula for civil, for civil, uh, civil war. But what the beauty to appreciate here is that both sides are right. You have to understand this. If I, the most extreme example, I, I, the most extreme example of all, you know, according to Torah law, you can own a slave. You can own a slave. Except, the Gemara says, one who owns a slave owns a master. Because in Jewish law, if you own a slave, the slave has all the rights. And you have all the obligations. If a Jew owns a slave and there's only one bed, the slave gets the bed. If there's only one pillow, the slave gets the pillow. You're not allowed to make him walk around in circles, even though you own him, because that's uh, frustrating. You have all sorts of obligations, right? When he goes free, you have to provide him riches. I mean... So now, the obligation of the Medrash says like this. The slave has the obligation to work like a slave. The master has the obligation to treat him like his brother. So imagine a relationship where the slave works like a slave, loyally, and the master treats him like his brother. Everything's fine. Imagine one day the master comes to the slave and says, you should be working like a slave. And the slave says to him, what are you talking about? You should be treating me like a brother. <coughs> you have a formula for strife, and they're both quoting the Torah. They're both saying true. The problem is they're focusing on the wrong end of the deal. In marriage, if he keeps saying to her, why aren't you doing your share of your obligations? Why aren't you providing what you should for me? And she says, you know, you're supposed to provide for me. They're both saying true, but you will not have harmony there. Is the point clear? The Torah sets itself... is very clear, huh? <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> what you mean is you're going to go home tonight and say, Darling, what can I do for you? <laughs> That's what you mean, right? <laughs> you don't walk home... You're, you're walking and say, Huh? <laughs> so the first thing to note here is that the Torah sets itself up as obligation thou shalt and thou shalt not the Torah doesn't say you have a right to this and a right to that the oral law brings that out of course you have a right to your property and a right to your life and dignity and so of course you do because the obligations translate into other people's rights obviously but what we're trying here is to develop people who focus on of course you have to have an external tough 
you have to have a tough exterior. If you bring up a child who's only sensitized to what he owes, right, and he's not aware of what his rights are in a society like that around us, he gets eaten alive. Eaten alive. And therefore, that Jewish ideal is a child who, in the privacy of his intimate relationships, is only a giver. But he has a tough, shrewd exterior to defend himself against the bitter world. There's no question about it. Yaakov, I mean, a Jacob, right, Yaakov. He was the ultimate flexible and pliant giver. But when he had to deal with the Lavan, when he had to deal with the swindler and the cheat, so he was able to meet it on the same terms, legally and, and morally, but he had to meet that. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a, a person who is only a giver, but has the shrewdness to understand that the world is not like that. That's unfortunately a practical reality. So the first thing to note is that the Torah is set up as obligation, right? You know, there's a classic, the classic approach to this, of course, which I would be derelict in my duty if I didn't, didn't mention this. You know that the Torah was given in such a, an intense state of obligation that there was no free will at all. You know, the Gemara says that Kafa Leim Har Kegigis, he held a mountain over them like a, like a barrel. The Medrash says, it says they stood, but Tachtit Hahar, the Jewish people stood at the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai. But literally in Hebrew, those words are problematic. Tachtit hahar means loosely translated at the foot of the mountain. But more rigorously translated, it means underneath the mountain. So what does it mean they stood underneath the mountain? So the Midrashic literature, the Talmud, says that Hashem held the mountain over them, and He said, do you wish to accept the Torah? If you do, good. If not, shun take for us, and there will be your, your, your burial place. You'll be buried alive. Actually, it says, there you'll be buried, not here. Which implies an ongoing death throughout history, if you live without Torah. So the Jewish people said, well, we accept. And it's very problematic. The Talmud goes on to ask, isn't that an illegitimate contract? If you force someone into signing or to acceptance of a deal, and, and, and they're forced into it, then how can that be binding? And the Talmud debates that question. How are we obliged by the Torah? If we made an unconditional, an un, un, what you call, un, um, you couldn't rescind, unrescindable ob obligation, we, we took that on, if it was forced on us with no free will. On the contrary, it was no free will at all. In many ways, in many ways. And the Talmud deals with that and explains why we are obliged and why we were obliged since then. That's not our subject now. But you see that the condition of our acceptance was with the mountain held over us. So the Maharal, the famous argument here between Tosfus, the medieval commentaries, and the Maharal was late. It's a famous argument for one reason. is because it's almost unheard of for latter-day authorities to argue with such early authorities. And this is one example where it happens. But the Tosfus says the following thing. Why were they forced to accept the Torah? Why were they forced to accept it? So it says like this, because they said, Nasevanishma, we will do sight unseen, we will accept it, and then we will understand, which is a remarkable statement, that's the greatness of the Jewish people, they accepted the Torah as binding and obligatory without yet knowing what its details would be, and then after you've given it to us and made us bound, we will hear what's in it. But that's not a logical way to accept a contract. First, first you read the details down to the fine print, and then you decide if you like accept it. And the other nations did so, and rejected. The Jewish people said, if you're giving it, it must be good, we'll take it sight unseen. And then we'll hear what's in it. But, although they had committed themselves to accept it, says Tosis, says, when the time came, the fear, the awe of that experience, the fire and the lightning and the, the awesomeness of Hashem's presence was so utterly terrifying that they couldn't take it. And therefore, at that time when they tried to flee, or would have tried to flee, they were pinned down and held. The analogy is, The analogy here is, um, is uh, when a person agrees to do something good, which will ultimately be frightening. Let's say you have a young man who was brought up in a country where he had no Jewish background at all, never had a circumcision, let's say, Bris Miller. And he becomes more interested, he becomes seeing, he learns about the power of it and its importance, he commits himself to be circumcised. Very idealistic, he's wonderful. Total free will, no question about it, he's going to go through with it. When they march him into the place where this thing's about to take place, and he sees uh, some of the instruments, you know, laid out in, in all cold, the cold steel, then what happens is a rapid change of emotion. And what happens then is you have four big, hefty uh, assistants who hold him down, right, by force while this procedure is done. Why? Because you know he wants to go through with it. He signed already. He signed and he agreed. Why is he trying to run away now? This is not because he doesn't want to go through with that, only because the experience is frightening. Uh, is this clear? Tosa says, Tosa said that that's what happened. 
That means there's no question they wanted to go through with it. But it was so awesome and so frightening when they came to that incredible moment in history that they couldn't, as humans, they couldn't take it. It was tr- more than awesome. The, the Gemara says they died. The Gemara says that when Hashem spoke the first of the Ten Commandments, they all died. Meaning that the Shamas, their souls, as it were, flew back to the source, which was then revealed. And the bodies were exploded backwards. And then they were revived and brought forth for the second of the Ten Commandments, and Hashem spoke again, they exploded and died again. And the third time, the second time they were revived and brought forth, they said to Moshe, and it's enough. It's a hard experience. You hear the rest and tell us from now, we've heard enough. You've heard enough to know. It's a terrifying experience. Imagine being exploded in death in that way, and being revived and happen again. So, so that's what Tosa says. The Maral says that this is not the correct explanation. The Maral says that they never would have run away. They never would have run away. They took it on voluntarily. They meant it and they would not have disappeared. But it was held over them because the nature of Torah is that it's pure obligation. Says the Maral, the Torah had to be given in a way that's obligatory because this is not optional. It's true that the Jews opted for it and they accepted it voluntarily. But the nature of Torah is that it's obligatory. It's as obligatory as reality. Because the reality of the world is Torah. Torah fashions the reality of the world. If you don't live according to Torah, Torah isn't in the world, the world is not. Right? That's what the verse says. If it would not be for my covenant day and night, I would not have created the laws of heaven and earth. In other words, if you don't accept Torah, the world goes back to its primal void. It's not a punishment, it's a consequence. Therefore, Torah was not... It wasn't because they were frightened they were going to run away, says the Maral. Torah has to be given as an obligation because that's its nature. Now, this may not be a popular message in our generation. People think about freedom. They want to be obliged. But the Torah says only, the only real freedom is being a slave to the truth. That's the real freedom. Because if you reject that and you become free and you become... You live in a world of unreality, you may feel free, but you're not real. That's why we say, Charus ala luchais. The Gemara says, means engraved on the tablets. Read it as, Charus ala luchais. Freedom is on the tablets. Our concept of freedom is being enslaved to reality. It's a remarkable thing. And therefore, that's the sense of enslavement. It's a sense of obligation. And that's why the Torah's phrase is obligation. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. Because, yeah, that's what it is. Now, so far so good? Are we still together? Now, the two tablets. Why are there two tablets? You see, there are two sets of obligation here. There are two categories of obligation. The first category of obligation is God. Hashem. The laws that he ex- extracts and demands from me. But then there's another set of obligations. You oblige me. In as much as you're human. That means, the second set of tablets, I'm not allowed to kill. I'm not allowed to commit immorality. I'm not allowed to steal. I'm not allowed to bear false testimony against you. I'm not allowed to covet what you have. I'm not even covet what you have. Right? Those five. Those five commandments are my obligations to you. And they're on a separate set of tablets because it means that you oblige me. It's a remarkable thing. Let's, let's first, we're trying to make this clear. That means you, you, you have to understand this. As a human being, you've got two mechaivim. That means there are two, category, two, there are two essences, two entities that are, obligate you. One is God. One is Hashem. He obliges you. And the second is every other human being. In as much, of course, a human only obliges you because that human is built on a spark that itself is divine. We call that Salam Kim. The reason you shouldn't kill somebody... The reason you shouldn't kill somebody, ultimately, is because he's B'Tselem Kim. When you kill that individual, you're separating a divine spark from its manifestation in the world. It's true. And it's definitely true that when you kill that person, you're offending a divine commandment. There's no question about it. But the thing to realize here, that most of us don't realize, is that respecting human life, when you treat a person correctly, it's not only because God says, treat him correctly, it's because he obliges in as much as he's human. The, perhaps the best way to put this across, just to show you, you might say, well, what's the difference? Who cares? You're being academic. Are you being academic? What's the difference? As long as you're obliged. What's the difference if you go and visit somebody who's sick because you're obliged to visit him because he's sick? Or because God tells you you're obli- you have to visit him? What's the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference is striking. If you fulfill interpersonal mitzvahs because God commands you, so then the person doesn't matter. The person doesn't matter. Why are you visiting this person who's sick? You care about him? No, he's irrelevant. I'm visiting him who's sick because God commands me. He is an object of my mitzvah. This sick individual is like an ass, like a lulav. And what I'm doing when I visit him who's sick, I'm going to shake him. That's what I'm going to do. Because he's a, yeah? He's an object of my mitzvah. And you know what? The sicker he is, the better. 
Because the more he needs me, the more desperately sick he is, the more he's suffering. What a juicy mitzvah here. This is really... <laughs> Can you see where this, where this leads? And if I come to visit him and he's had the chutzpah to get better, right? I don't want a chutzpah. I make the effort and he gets better. He could have suffered a little. He could have been a, at least bled a bit or, you know... You see, can you feel the problem here? The problem is if you use people, imagine what a marriage is, in a very ultra, ultra religious type of a mode where the marriage partner is the object of mitzvah. I'm doing this for you now because, you know, he obliges me. You're irrelevant. <laughs> you, 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 you serve the purpose of a lulav. Or an es- you, know, can, you can feel that, you can feel, I hope, the problem here. Of course, when you treat someone correctly, you are honoring Hashem, and you're fulfilling His mitzvah. There's no question. That's the ultimate reason for this mitzvah. But the nature of this mitzvah, we call the tzura of the mitzvah, the form of the mitzvah, is unlike man-god mitzvahs, the mitzvah here is to feel the person. That's a fundamental message. Let me, let me share with you, you know, let me share with you a problem here. <coughs> Perhaps the, I, I said that people brought up in a more religious mode, this may be a problem. The people in the so-called Baal Tshuva mode, the Chazrim B'Tshuva, those who do not have any religious background, and become more committed, right? They become more knowledgeable, more committed, more practicing in their Jewish observance. Many times people like that will tell you of a problem. If you speak to them deeply and you scratch beneath the surface, many times sensitive people, especially people richly emotional, people will tell you that they experience a problem. And the problem is, and I I can tell you this personal experience, I've worked in this field for many years, people will tell you that before they were so-called religious, they enjoyed a tremendous spontaneity and of emotion. No one told them what to do. They did it out of rich emotion. If someone was sick, they went to, to help, right? There was a rich experience of their own inner being, right? In relationships, positive relationships, difficult relationships, somebody was sick, needed help. Now that they become religious, they tell you that the spontaneity has died. That a deep emotional level is absent now. Why? Because, look, let's face it. Let's say you're not a religious individual. Somebody's sick, very sick. Why do you go and help? Because you're motivated. You, you, by the spontaneous, you, you have a deep welling up of the desire. You, you, you feel the situation. But if you're religious, <laughs> why are you visiting? Because of obligation. So the mode is not a mode of spontaneous depth. It's a mode of going because you have to. So when you knock on the door, the person knows that you're coming to visit because you're obliged. And you know you're doing because you're obliged. And you know that he knows you're there because you're obliged. And you know that he knows that you know you're only there because you're obliged. So... It's a completely dry, and while you're there, you're looking at your watch, and he's seeing you looking at your watch, and he's ho- probably hoping you'd go, because he wants to rest anyway, and you bother bothering. I mean, <laughs> can you feel what's happening here? And in many areas of marriage, that should be delicate and sensitive. Sometimes there intrudes this problematic element, because what was spontaneous and, 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 and a natural expression of self before, might now be converted into religious, technical... Obli- can, can you see how damaging this... That's a real problem. And the, the classic error here is because the people don't understand, people in this mode <coughs> don't understand that the nature of, of the mitzvah here is to feel the person's need. That's the idea of the mitzvah. The mitzvah is an exercise here, an opportunity to train yourself to feel that, yeah, despite the fact that it's a mitzvah. You should, if you should arrive at a point where you've trained yourself to the, to the extent that you would do this even if it weren't a mitzvah. What you should be focusing on here is the genuine need of the person. If you arrive to visit that person after a lot of effort and you find they've got better, your immediate response should be thrilled. You should be thrilled at that. Because you weren't focusing on fulfilling your obligation. You were focusing on helping the person who needs it. But it's a very easily perverted direction. Is, is, is the point clear? And therefore, there's a separate, there's separate tablets. There are two separate tablets. You know, the Gemara the, the says that when you die, you get asked two amazing questions. You get asked a number of questions. But there are two amazing questions. One is, Him lachta kencha alecha be'ema be'yira. Did you, very trans- difficult to translate the word, laham lech, it means to make him king over you, as it were. To make, did you make yourself subservient? Did you, how do you say, did you crown or, or, or set up Hashem over you as your, as your obligator and your obliger and your ruler with awe and fear? So far, so good. Second statement, Him lachta did you set your friend up over you, your fellow human being, as your ruler with pleasantness and kindness of spirit? You hear those two questions? They ask you two questions. I would have thought, when I get up to that world, he'll say to me, he's going to say to me, did you do what I told you? 
did you do what I told you? Did you take me seriously? But it turns out there are going to be two questions. Did you take me seriously? And secondly, did you take your fellow individual seriously? Did you relate to his need because of who he is? And never mind the fact that I asked you. It's a remarkable thing. That means you're obliged here. I mean, it's an unpleasant message, isn't it? I mean, it's difficult enough honoring him properly. I should no. But when it gets to human beings, they, they're completely impossible. I mean, that's the problem. And yet the Torah tells you that you're obliged. You're obliged because of who a person is remarkable. Thing. If you think this through a little bit further, you'll see that... Um, if you think this through a little bit further, you'll see that uh, it goes further. It goes further. You know that the two sets of tablets are actually parallel. You know, we said they fit together like this in a, what do you call it, a complementary fashion. The five commandments on the man-God side parallel exactly the five on the man-Man side, one-to-one. -one. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. You know that? Let's try and trace it through. There are two sets here. There are two primary sets, and they parallel each other exactly. What's the first commandment on the man God? I mean, there's nothing more basic than Ten Commandments, right? Right? You are approach to us tomorrow night. At least you want to have this clear. At least, right? It's a good place to begin, isn't it? <coughs> What's the first commandment on the man God side? I know Hashem I am Hashem. I am God. You know, it's not phrased as a mitzvah. It's the mitzvah of belief, of faith. Hamanas alakus, like the Rambam says, belief in God. Knowing, as he says, knowing Hashem, knowing Hashem. But it's not phrased as thou shalt. You know that. It's not phrased as thou shalt. Even though there's no question, this is the primary obligation. And the reason that it's not phrased as a commandment, and again, we showed you speak about it, a basic approach to it is this, that you can't command someone to believe in something that he doesn't believe in. And if he does believe in it, you don't need to command him. But you hear the logic. I mean, believe in me. How can you say to somebody, believe that I exist? If he hears you speaking, he obviously believes, doesn't he? And if he doesn't hear you speaking in the first place, then, then who exactly is telling me to believe it? I mean, it just doesn't begin. And therefore, this is something that you have to decide in the privacy of your own, in that lonely space of your own primary will. You have to decide whether this is the direction that you move in or not. There's no external... You can't be commanded. Because, again, if you hear the voice of the command, then you know there's one who commands you. You've already believed. And if you refuse to hear his voice because you don't believe that he's there, then no amount of thou shalt is going to make any difference to you because you're not hearing the voice. Is the point clear? And therefore, it's simply a statement of fact. I mean, there's much deeper levels of will, of course, because I know Hashem al is the deeper statement of fact about the world, because that's the reality of the world. Hashem's name means existence. The divine name, yud ke vav means was, is, and will be, and gives existence to everything that is. So you're talking about relating to reality here. But nevertheless, that's the first command. What is the commandment that parallels it on the man, man's side? Lo, tir, tzach. You're not allowed to kill. <coughs> Can you see the parallel here? The first on the man, God's side, is honoring Hashem because of who He is. That means honoring, it relating to you, believing. That means that's the reality of existence. Not killing, or let's phrase it as positive. Respect for human life means that his life has value just because he is. That's all. Can you see the parallel? Yeah, I mean... It, it's, it's, it's humiliating that we need to speak about this mitzvah, the value of a human life. But I mean, this generation, this is in completely chaotic disarray. I mean, if there's one thing that's been forgotten, right? It is, it's debatable which has been more forgotten in our generation, the first or the second. Sensual immorality, the second, or the value of you. I don't know which is worse. There's a neck and neck, I would say, competition, in terms of that. that, that you know. But it's humiliating that people need to get together to remind themselves that the primary obligation is, is, is not killing people. Yeah? This generation has raised it to the level where killing of people is a completely thoughtless, wanton, mass destruction of people who, whatever, who knowing who they are. Without even being reasonably sure that the point you're trying to make will get them. I mean, it's, it's, the enormity of it is beyond expression. I don't think there's ever been in the history of the world a manifestation of uh, uh, yeah, I'm talking about terrorism in case you in case you missed the point uh, that's fundamentally different there's always been war and destruction and, and battles to death but you're talking about here an ideology of wanton killing where, where it's very very unclear that anything will be achieved at all very unclear some major terrorist acts are done without anybody claiming not even making a point of even claiming any I mean That's a remarkable thing. It's completely wanton 
means just like on the divine side there's a complete unawareness of the deepest obligation, that means the sense of reality of his transcendent being, there's also the extinguishing of that spark of condition of the human being on the other side, and they both disappear. I'm not now getting into so-called religious terrorists. That needs its own, needs its own analysis. Needs fits the principle too, but needs needs to be spoken out, but not here. So, can you see the parallel between these two? The second, the second, right, is you shall have no other gods, right? Lo yelacha Elohim acherim al panai. That means. You see, the pattern goes like this. The first mitzvah, believing in Hashem, knowing Hashem, is establishing reality. The second mitzvah is, don't set up something false as reality. What does it mean not to have other gods? Don't attribute reality to something that isn't. Okay? Don't stray after and be attracted to that which is unreal, that, that is not your correct partner. C- can you see what the second of the man-man mitzvahs is? No adultery immorality. Do you see what's happening? Again, can you see the parallel? Uh, can you see the parallel here? The prohibition of idolatry, other gods, is parallel to extraneous, a relationship outside of the marital correct bond. Can you see the parallel? In fact, not only is it parallel, it's explicit in many Torah sources. Idolatry in many Torah sources is called znus. Znut, which means sexual immorality. That's what it's called. Right? In fact, there's a deep tradition that's brought down from the Gaon of Vilna, who says that it came all the way down, ish mi pi ish, from Moshe Do you know what it means to say that? The God of Vilna told his students that this transmission, this tradition, that this, this particular fact was transmitted generation to generation, word mouth to mouth, all the way back to Sinai, that no idolatrous cult in the world has ever existed without an immoral component. You hear that? Again, I don't want to mention present examples in this generation that have been in the news lately, and it's not, it's not our, our purpose. But wherever you look, we have a, we have a, 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 a penetrating tradition penetrating throughout history, that there's never been an idolatrous mode that does not involve this kind of immorality as well. You remember the golden calf? What did they use it for? What did they use the golden calf for? That Im- they, they, it immediately got into a situation of immorality, right? And it's a classic Torah expression, Loi Abdu Yisrael Avodazor, the Jewish people never, se- never served idols except to allow themselves immorality in public. Can you see the connection? And all the words, again, this is not the place to go to it, but all of the words that describe facets of idolatrous practice are the same words that we use to describe immoral, yeah, the I- immoral connections and, and uh, the breakdown of that area. Those are the two. What's the third expression? What's the third expression? Of not using Hashem's name in vain. Right? Don't take His name, don't, which means, the first commandment, that Hashem exists, statement of reality. Second, don't give reality to something else. That's not real. Third, don't use reality for something unreal. What does it mean to use his name? Let, let's say, for example, you make an oath. How do you transgress this commandment? By making an oath using Hashem's name, where the oath is invalid. Like you swear to something that's not true. Or you swear to something that's obvious. That's also taking his name. Right? What are you doing? You're using the source of reality for something that's not. What's the third of the man, man commandments? No steal. What are you doing? You misuse it. Do you understand what's happening? You're taking an a, a attachment to a, a person and you're taking it away into a place that is not, yeah, that's not correct. That's the parallel. What's the fourth of the man God commandments? To keep? Shabbos. I mean, you know the Ten Commandments, don't you? If not, you better be here all night tomorrow night. <laughs> At least. You better stay till then. You better stay here until. <laughs> and for punishment, you can write out all 613. <laughs> the point is that the next is keeping Shabbos. Right? What is Shabbos? Testify to the reality. Yeah, that means acknowledge it, testify. Shabbos is the. Testimony to creation, isn't it? Zechel Lemaan Sebrashi. Shabbos, you do to testify, yeah, you stop doing your own manipulation of creation and take it back to its source and acknowledge its source. What is the fourth of the false testimony? Can you see the exact parallel here? The fourth of the man man commandments is to testify falsely to something that never happened, right? as opposed to the truth. 
And the fifth of the man God commandments is honoring parents. What does that mean? Take everything back to its true source in reality. Right? Instead of thinking that you are independent and you came on the scene and you are your own cause, you go back to parents and acknowledge, you trace things back to a point of origin. The idea of tracing things back to a point of origin is considered to be one of the deepest, if not the deepest, traits of human logical self-development. You know that the sources of the Talmud marshals to prove the greatness of the myths of honoring parents are always from non-Jews. Non-Jews! You know that. Why? To teach you that this is absolutely logical. This is not... That means to go back to your source. As opposed to thinking that you are the cause of your own existence and things start with you. You know what the characteristic is here in, in, in general character traits? You know what we call that? Hakarasato, gratitude. What does gratitude mean? Tracing the source of the thing that you were given to the one who gave. You trace it back to its source. When you say thank you, now the Hebrew word for thanks is the same as admission. In English you say thanks and I admit. Two separate things. In Hebrew, mode ani means I thank you and I admit. What's the commonality? Thanking you means I admit that it wasn't me, but it came from you. There's an admission that it's not me. There's a giving up of self to trace it to where it genuinely came from. In fact, the deep sources say that if you manifest the tray of gratitude properly, you will discover Hashem. You'll eventually penetrate to the source of all reality. Because you develop the habit of tracing the thing back to where it genuinely comes from, you will eventually trace all of reality back to its ultimate and genuine source. So that's why it's an ultimate characteristic. And what is, of course, the fifth of the man-man mitzvahs? Not allowed to? Covet. Right? That means trace this object back to where it belongs and leave it there. You shouldn't have the desire to take it away from that it belongs to me, everything belongs to me. I can look at whatever I want and it's mine. Everything is, propor- is apportioned and taken back to its correct... Do you understand the per- And therefore, these are the, these are the parallels. Okay, there's a lot more to say. Obviously, it's getting late. But um, the concept here is that, again, just to revise, we're talking here about the ten elements of statement of reality. That's why these are fundamental. The five elements of handling reality correctly, from acknowledging it all the way to tracing everything back to there, all the components in between. The same gilui, the same manifestation needs to be brought out in interactions, not only with the ultimate source, but even with every reflection of that source. Right? And I mean, there's very little... You know, more, if you want to focus on something for a spiritual program, let's say, for the next year, you know, I mean, there's, they are just working through the first two, let's say, on each of them intensely. Can you imagine what kind of a world it would be out there? Let's say even just one of them, just respect for what human life means. And of course, it's on an individual level. You know, you don't you walk out of here thinking, well, I'm okay because I didn't kill too many people in the last week. <laughs> Just one or two here and there, but I didn't. <laughs> that's not what we mean, right? You know what we mean. If, you, if you're already on the level where, where that's mufrach, where that's not for you, if you're already on that level, then of course it means a level of respect for human life that is not just killing, talking about any humiliation, embarrassment, putting down, lack of correct as a whole. In, in, in proportion to your p- personal level of achievement and refinement, obviously this can be done. To shame someone beyond a certain level, to humiliate someone in public. These, are, these, these have got the laws of killing. To understand this. It's a, a harsh word, the lack of a smile. That might be a little piece of death here. Obviously, it goes in proportion. But I think the object should be for each of us, if, if we may end on a note of, uh, it's not my place to tell you what to do. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> is if, what, if you, we take on a practical program, is to upgrade whatever our level is in this area. Yes, if it means, at the broader level, of course, unfortunately, killing people is, is incredibly relevant. But if one is holding at a level where one's a bit more refined than that, then it means adding life to the dignity of what that human being's existence is. Perhaps if we do that at our level, it will filter down through the ranks so that at the most gross and crude level, we'll be able to lift that as well.